All right, welcome back. Let's get into chapter three, right? Uh, so chapter two, we looked at the methods. Methods are pure, um, are not offensive, yet without compromise. In demonstration of the spirit and power, being spirit-directed, being strategic, and also being relevant, right? So remember this even as you you know are part of a local church you're starting you're planning to serve in the local church these are pointers that you can keep in mind all right so the government and structure of the local church now if you look at the book of acts uh, when the local church was birthed there were many things over over time that there, there were many things they didn't understand Right? But over time, the church began to understand, began to grow in the things of God. And uh, we thank God for the great apostle Paul who brought so much of wisdom and clarity uh, when it comes to the church. Now, what is, we look at uh, the first local church, the church in Jerusalem. I mean, look at a few insights on how this church developed a, a, a structure. Right? Now think of this, one man, Peter, preached the gospel, 3,000 people have come. Can you picture 3,000 people? What, what, what did they do the next, uh, next time they met? Right? How, did they, how were they able to you know, consolidate what they have? How were they able to you know, uh, make it more effective? That even now we're talking about the church in Jerusalem. So let's look at a few things regarding the church, the government structure, and we we'll learn some lessons from this. Right? Uh, maybe some of us want to start a local church, or some of us are, you know, are already serving in the local church, right? Uh, in the in, in in teams, volunteer teams in the local church. Let's look at this, right? The the first local church, the church in Jerusalem, and we basically want to get a blueprint. Of what a church must look like, and even as we continue with this session, with this course, we'll we we'll look at uh, the different aspects of a local church. That's very interesting. So, but before that, let's get into this: the local church, the first local church, which is the church in Jerusalem. So there was only one church in Jerusalem, so it was only one church, which is also the citywide church. Now, for example, Bangalore. When God sees Bangalore, He sees one church. But when we look at it, there are citywide churches, plenty of churches all across Bangalore. But in the local in Jerusalem, that was the first church. So there was no other churches. Only later on, Antioch came in, the church in Antioch. So what happened? We all know this, but let's quickly go over this. Uh, there were 120 people on the day of Pentecost uh, who recognized uh, the 12 apostles who were recognized as the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Peter was the initial leader. Peter later moves out uh, of Judea and, and James take over, takes over the leadership in the church. So if you look at Acts chapter 15, the council in Jerusalem, James is proceeding over the church. Right Now, why did Peter move out of leadership? There is no reason for that. Maybe he felt, you know, he wants to spend more time in ministering to people rather than doing the organizational thing. There's nothing wrong. Remember Moses? You had millions of people brought out of Egypt, and he's sitting and uh, solving problems between two people. No, actually, you should not get angry with him. Now, Moses has already seen God. He's gone through so much of pressure. He has seen God. He is direct, directly God is speaking to him, and he's sitting and solving problems there. Then his father-in-law came and said, "What is wrong? You know, you you raise up people who will look after all these matters, and you look after the spiritual matters, because you have a task in hand. You have to take these people out of this desert into the promised land, and you're sitting and solving problems." He took my food. I he ate my uh, fish. All these things doesn't make sense. So Moses said, "I'm not going to do all of this. Let others handle it." Same way, maybe Peter said, "Let me look at ministry. That's what I want to do." 
So for all these administration, government, structure, all this, James came in. And this is the James who is Jesus' brother, half-brother, right? Because the other James was martyred already, right? So as time progressed, Acts 15, at the first council of Jerusalem, we see the apostle James as the primary leader of Jerusalem delivering the final decision. What was the thing that was happening? Just a... We went through it, right? In the book of Acts. What is it? The problem was, should the Gentiles be circumcised? Or once they believe in Jesus, do they uh, are they free from circumcision? So that was the biggest problem now. So that was the council, the meeting in Jerusalem there. right? And the final decision, James himself wrote the letter and said, okay, this is our final de decision. The Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. So go and give it to all the churches. James was the leader of the church, right? So Paul also meets with James personally when he comes to Jerusalem and then addresses James first in his epistle in Galatians. So later on came the emergence of deacons. Now let's read Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. Now this is important to read so that we, we see the role of deacons emerging through this uh, passage of scripture. Go ahead. 1 to 6. 6, 1 to 6. Acts 6, 1 to 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their windows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So, the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to ne neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nisanor, Timon, yeah, so I think we can skip the names. Uh, right, we can skip this. the names. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Yeah. So now look at this. It's a good problem that's happening here. Acts 6. As the number of disciples was multiplying, there was a complaint that rose. Now there were two groups of Jews, the Hellenistic Jews and the, uh, which was the other one? Hebrewic Jews, right? So the Hellenistic Jews, that was, they felt that, hey, we are being, you know, overlooked, right? So what did they do? The leader said, see, we can't waste, waste our time, but we cannot spend the most of our time trying to solve this problem. So wise thing to do, let's raise up some leaders. These leaders will look after the serving of food, make sure that everything's all right, so that we, uh, that is Paul and, uh, sorry, Peter and the other leaders, can focus their attention on prayer and ministry. Was that a good idea? Yes or no? Was it a good idea? Yes or no? Yes? Right? Why was it a good idea? Because these guys were spending most of their time trying to solve small problems. Now, what was the report? They chose seven people selected for the daily distribution of food. Look at the criteria. Honest report. Now, for distributing food, you don't need honest report. Unless, you know, one person, he gives three chicken pieces and the other person, he gives one chicken piece. But honest report. That means people in the congregation must feel this guy is an honest guy. So I can put my trust in him. He'll serve the food correctly. Two, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, why do you need the Holy Spirit for uh, serving food? The Holy Spirit wants you, don't give this person food. Go to the next person. <laughs> or the Holy Spirit will say, wake up, it's time to feed everyone. No. But why do you want the full of the Holy Spirit to serve food? Three, full of wisdom. Now, we don't need wisdom to serve food. All we need is common sense. If the food is put, you tell them, move on. But full of wisdom. And took responsibility. Well, look at that word, responsibility.
for the daily distribution of food. Now, the word uh, deacons means helper or servant, right? It's there on your next page. You can see that the helper, servant, or attendant. Now, when the when the leaders here they raised up the seven uh, people. They were not called deacons at that time, but they fulfilled the role of the deacons. The word deacons came in much later. So these seven men who were selected were full of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and took responsibility. So what does the word deacon mean? Server, helper, attendant. Right? That's what they have been chosen to do. They were chosen to serve, to help, to attend to people. Now, in, in this passage, we don't see the word deacons, but we see the emergence of the role of deacons. Everyone with me, right? The, the role of the deacons is coming out there. So what is it that we can learn from this? When we raise up leaders, don't always look for gifts. Don't always look for skill or talent or looks. That's not the priority. The priority is honest report, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and take responsibility. Now, you can have the first three and not have the last one, take responsibility. That's again not right. It's, go it's, not, a fruitful, it's not going to be a fruitful leadership. Why? Because as a leader, we must take responsibility of what we have done and what we have not done. Right, so there will be times when, you know, as a leader, they they come and say, "Did you do this? I gave you a task. Were, were you able to do it?" As a leader, you must be responsible enough to say yes or no. If yes, good. If no, okay. Why couldn't you do it? Responsibility, right? Now, when it's like it's like this, you you, the first thing I tell a husband and a wife if they come to me and they say. You know, I'm looking out for a job, or or, or if I if I know if one of the the family is going through a, a financial difficulty, first thing I ask is, are you working? When they say I'm not working, I've been looking out for a job for past six months, ten months. Then I normally ask them, why? What is the reason? Right? What is the reason for you to not work at time? Because sometimes people don't want to take responsibility. When things are handed over to them easily, life is easy, right? So that's not right. We have all of these honest report, full of wisdom, full of the spirit, but we must also take responsibility. As leaders, we must take responsibility. You start small, start from where you are, right? Um, if it means you know responsibilities in in your in Bible college, do it. Ask God. To help you, help you to be honest, help you to be uh, led by the Spirit, be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, why full of the Holy Spirit? What is the fru fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience. Now, is it you need patience to serve food for these uh, widows? Now we're thinking, why you need the Holy Spirit? You need patience. You can get angry and say, no, yesterday you ate, no? Today was the problem to eat. You need patience. You need the love. You need to walk in that kind of love, right? So we see this uh, this emergence of deacons in the local church. Now, without the deacons, it'd be very difficult. Imagine on a Sunday service, right? We don't have any volunteers. How is it going to be? Just think of it. How is it going to be? I will start crying <laughs> because I can't. There are so many things involved. You know, the moment I go to church, everything is done. The projector is fixed. The sound team is done. Now, uh, you know, the chairs are fixed. Everything, the elements are kept. Everything is done. Book table. Now, if, if it was not for these volunteers and these leaders, we can't do anything. It'll be like me, by the time I'm going up to preach, I'll be tired. I want to go home. Deacons and helpers and attenders, those who are volunteers, 
is a gift from God. It's a gift that God gives us. Look at Rome, Romans 16, 1 and 2. Okay, uh, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in sense Crea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and myself also. Now, Paul is calling her, calling this sister Phoebe, uh, saying she's a helper. He doesn't yet use the word deacon, but Paul is referring to she's somebody who is helping out in the church. Remember, Phoebe was the first one who opened her heart to the gospel. I think it was in Philippi. Right? She, Paul is preaching. Phoebe received the gospel and said, come home and you know you can rest in my house, stay in my house. Right? Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ, Jesus, who... Uh, Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now the word deacons comes up. Right? Uh, and then if you look at the what the deacons do, they need to adhere to godly standards. Right? Deacons can engage in spiritual ministry. Right? So Stephen, for example, what was his work? He was chosen among the seven. What were they chosen for? Serving the food. But he was also involved in ministry because it says that uh, Stephen worked signs and wonders, Acts 6, 8. Why do you think they wanted to stone Stephen? Because he was serving food. No. Because while he was doing that, serving the food, he was also preaching the gospel. There were signs, wonders, and miracles. And that is why they brought him out and they killed him. They, and he was martyred. It was not because he was serving food. It was because they saw signs, wonders, and miracles. And later, Philip planted a church in Samaria. So deacons can be involved both in spiritual matters and in administrative matters. Right? So when, when especially in the early church, since the church was growing, they raised up these deacons. They gave them administrative work so for example it was a sunday church day now you have 3000 people in the church meeting in different places in jerusalem just picture that there's many things involved right you need to find a place maybe you had to pitch tents so that they have some rest i mean they have some shade or you need to get the uh, you know elements or something, right? A lot of things that are involved. There are uh, women and children that need to be looked after, right? Remember Jesus? 5,000 people came listening to him. Then they came to him and said, uh, people are hungry. We need to, we need, they need food. Jesus didn't say, no need food. So they need food. What do you have? Five loaves of bread, two fish. Now imagine Jesus didn't have the 12 uh, disciples there. Please come and take what you want. It's not going to work, right? So as deacons are being raised up, they are given spiritual, uh, sorry, administrative tasks, tasks, but also the spiritual continues, the ministry continues, right? You get what I'm saying, right? So in the local church, your pastor may say, from now on, you do the PPT. Now, don't feel that is not that is some uh, you know it's not ministry. It is ministry. Why you're preparing the PPT? You can raise up a team. You can minister to the entire team. You know, I'll give you the story. What this real thing that happened in our church at at East? There was this this man who came to our church, and uh, he was from another faith. This happened in August 23, I guess, right? Last year. He came to our church and he sat at a church. And he, after church, he came, he spoke to me. Um, somebody had invited him, but he was from another faith. And after that, we, we, we just spoke for a while. He said, see, I didn't understand anything. I said, that's fine, all right. Uh, uh, I said the topic also is like, it was. we were talking about faith and science. So there was a lot of science involved in it. He said, I didn't understand anything. I said, it's, it's, it's all right. The topic also is a little hard. But try to come back and see if you'd like to uh, be part of the Sunday services. 
he never came for a long time. Uh, but after some time, maybe about a few months, he started coming again. And that time, you know, we were talking about, I think, faith and some simple topics. So he started coming every time. And as he kept coming, uh, I, I got to speak to him. And one of the things he mentioned to me when I asked him, what work do you do? He said, I'm, uh, I'm in the IT. And so I do a lot of IT work. Uh, and uh, so I understood. So the first thing that came to my mind was, I have to get him into the sound and setup team or the media team. So I asked him, do you like speakers and these cables, wires? Do you understand? Oh, yes. Before joining the IT, I was part of, um, uh, you know, like uh, this sound and setup, uh, you know, these uh, vendors. You know, he had his own uh, company, which didn't really work out. So he knows everything about sound and setup. Right? Only thing he didn't know about a digital mixer, but he knew everything else, right, about how the cables run, how to uh, switch on the speakers, all of that. So I told him, why don't you serve? There's one team called Sound and Setup you serve. And I just put him in the team. Now, I didn't spend too much time with him. But these guys in the team began to minister to him. Right? And this guy, this person, would see, you know, how come they're coming 6 o'clock in the morning setting up everything and just sitting at the back, no appreciation, nothing, doing everything. And after the church service, they're removing everything. So something caught his attention. But it was not the service. It was not the preaching. These guys, how come they are doing this? And he has asked them, how much you get paid for it? They said, no, we are all working professionals. We come here and do it as a volunteer. You don't get paid for this. No, we don't get paid. So his heart was really moved. And these guys in the sound and setup team started speaking to him, ministering to him, sending him verses, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, sending him the song list. They would purposely send him. I didn't know all of this. Purposely send him the song list. You listen to these songs because these are the songs the worship leader is doing coming Sunday. So this guy is faithfully listening to the songs so that he knows, or I don't know what. But by the end of it, by the end of six months, he became a believer. He accepted the Lord Jesus. He got baptized. His life completely changed. Right? And he recently got married. Complete change. He's the only believer in his family. Who did it? Our volunteer team. Which team? Sound and setup. So we must be, we must never look at, okay, ministry is only from the pulpit. No, it's not. Actually, the ministry is everywhere else apart from the pulpit. More ministry happens around I mean, pulpit. I can preach and altar call, but the real ministry happens outside. Right? And I was so touched that these guys, the sound and setup team, was able to do the administrative task. That's the first thing that came to my mind. They were like the deacons of the early church. Right? They did all the tasks, but they did the ministry also. They touched his life. And now he is bringing his wife. He's trying to minister to his brother and bro sister's family. And they all came and sat once. And then they said, don't bring, you know, they were upset with him because they brought him to church. Then he came and told, don't worry, even I was upset first time. You know, so he's trying to bring his entire family to God just because of this thing. Right, so we we must not restrict ourselves thinking this is not a ministry task. We raise up leaders, give them administrative tasks, but we also give them the ministry. How can you apply it in your church? The pastor says, from now on, you have to clean the chairs. What will you do? I'll find another church. <laughs> or you have to come and clean everything in the morning. What you do is you raise up two, three people, say, hey, come, we go to church. Even if they're not doing any work, you do it. What they will see will touch their lives. And you'll be able to minister to them, right? Um, then we see, after the raise of deacons, we see new churches raised. So uh, AD, Acts 8, AD 32, Philip was a deacon which God, whom God used to preach the Gospels. Uh, gospel with signs and wonders, and to plant a local church in 
Samaria, Acts 8. Acts 9, churches were raised up in other regions like Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and, and Lydda. Now, remember, these are all churches apart from the church in Jerusalem. Who is raising up these churches? Deacons. People who have part of the who were probably part of the uh, local church in Jerusalem went out and started planting churches. Right? No Bible college during that time, but they went and did it. Uh, Acts 11: A local church was raised up in Antioch, and there were two cities with this name: one situated in Pisidian Antioch and one in Asia Minor. So, what is the point? Believers are not just Apostle, not just the apostles in sorry, believers and not just the apostles in Jerusalem church were equipped and practiced preaching the gospel with signs, wonders, and miracles. So it was not just the 12. Oh, I saw Jesus, so I will preach. No, everyone else was able to do it. Two churches can be planted without an apostle and without a prophet. God can use anyone to plant a local church and any place. The Holy Spirit can use ordinary people, ordinary saints, ordinary deacons doing the smallest works in the church. God can use you to plant a church. He can. He really can. Look at Stephen. Look at you know the, the impact of his life. Look at the people that you know God has used over the years in the early church. Simple people, right? Simple people. God used them, and they were raised up as great leaders, right? Then comes the emergence of elders. Now, what was the first thing? Emergence of deacons. What would the deacons do? Administrative and ministry now look at the elders act in acts 11 acts chapter 11 we see the leaders of jerusalem referred to as elders so acts 11 30 let's read that acts 11 verse 30 uh, you can read it from your book itself this they did sending their gifts to the elders by barnabas and saul yeah this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of barnabas and saul so he's talking referring to the papers or the letters sent it to the elders of the church right uh, the elders included not only apostles but also spiritual leaders like barnabas and prophets like agabus now remember this in a church you may have people coming into a church right a local church especially with different levels of understanding and different levels of maturity so, for example, you start a church and you may have somebody come in who already knows a lot about second coming, revelations, all of it. Right? Understanding is high. But then you may have another group of people who are still new. They still have to understand faith, what is salvation, all the small, the initial stages. Now, here's where it comes the emergence of elders in the church in Jerusalem with about 3000 people added and more by the time it was Acts 11 there were plenty of more people than 3000 so there were people from different levels of maturity you get what I'm saying right so some of them were like okay I'll just I just know this much but some of them were like, hey I God I know more I know a little more of this right or their level of maturity is a little higher so what the church in Jerusalem did is said, okay, you look like you are matured. You're not fighting with everyone. You know something from the word and you're, you're able to you know, grasp the things of God. So you become a leader, become an elder in the church. So as an elder, he or she had uh, the responsibility almost as a pastor. Right? So as an elder, people would come to you and say, see, this is my problem. Can you help me out? Or this is a situation I'm facing. What should I do? So they were appointed to also uh, give direction to people in the church. Right? So when the church is about 3,000 and more people, Peter could not go one by one and ask everything okay, everything you're doing well. No, he can't do that. So the emergence of elders were people who were looking after 
the congregation within the church. Right? They were looking after like elders. Right? Now, when we say elders, it's mostly also elders by age. But we cannot put that in criteria. We cannot say, just because you're young, you cannot be an elder. No. You can have a person who's young and also be an elder in the church. Right? Because he may have gone through so much in life or he may be, uh, his spiritual level understanding may be very high. Right? So we see the appointing of new elders. During the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas returns to the communities of new believers and appoints elders. Right? Acts 14, 21 to 23. And when they preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, this is talking about Galatians, okay? They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith, and saying, we must, we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Right? Appointed, ordained. Elders, look at the word Greek word uh, kiertonia, which means to elect, right? Uh, by elect by stretching out or elevating the hand. So it simply means to ordain, means to appoint, right? Now, look at this Galatians. There are so many churches planted. Paul has to come back to Jerusalem. Now, what did he do? He said, We'll raise up leaders, raise up elders and you all will look after the church. Now, we don't know whether it was one elder per church or whether it was a team of five elders, but whether it was one or whether it was five elders, they were looking after the church, looking after the ministry that's happening within the church. And I'm sure they also would have, the elders would have appointed deacons, right? You get what I'm saying? Are you getting the picture now, right? The elders, may have appointed deacons within the church. So these elders were selected from among the community itself. The appointing of elders was with prayer and fasting, and hence it was a spiritual exercise rather than an administrative task. If you want to appoint somebody to set the, uh, you know, that's uh, something that I always say in our churches. If you want to be in the greeting team, you don't need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Do we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be in the greeting team? Yes. We need? Okay. Do we need a great revelation of God's word to be in the greeting team? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Just to say hi, welcome to church. We don't need a great big revelation of who God is. God, we just need availability. Can you come on time? If you have good teeth, smile, say welcome, get them to come in. That's all. It's not a big task, right? Uh, but we see that these elders had a different task. They were, they, there was, they were chosen by purely prayer and fasting. The deacons, uh, of course, they also prayed and fasted. But right now, if you look at it in in our setting. I don't need to pray and fast to get uh, volunteers for uh, sound and setup and media team. Right? But the moment, say, for example, Pastor says, you know, you have to, we have to appoint somebody who can help you within the church in terms of ministry, then it's an important task. So I'll have to pray and fast and say, God, lead me to the right person. Give me the wisdom because this person is going to be speaking into many lives within the church. What he or she says is going to impact lives. So I should be very careful. Right? Elders, um, the word elder comes from the Greek word presbyteros, which is, uh, which we get from the word presbyter, which is used in some churches even now. Right? Then comes the apostles and elders, which became a one leadership team. The first council in Jerusalem, we see apostles along with the elders at Jerusalem deliberating the problem whether the Gentile believers had to be circumcised. Right? So we see uh, a, a team happening there. Um, 
Then there was elders in Ephesus. Paul writes in Acts 20, 17 and Acts 20, 28. Can we read that? Acts 20, 17. Now, this is again, Paul is leaving Ephesus. He's been in Ephesus for about three years. Is it two or three years? But he's been in Ephesus for quite some time, two years of ministry in Ephesus. And now this is his final words. He's leaving Ephesus to go to Jerusalem. And this is what he does. Let's read. From Acts Milet 20. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Mm. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Mm. Take heed of yourselves and to all the flock. So, Paul has so, said, okay, he comes to Ephesus and he says, all the elders come. So with this, we know that it's not just one elder, right? He said, all the elders come, meet me there. And when they meet him, this is the final words he's saying. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. When he says take heed, that means watch over yourselves, right? As elders, take heed, watch over your lives. And watch over the flock, the sheep, the sh because you are the shepherd, and among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So Paul is not saying, "Hey, listen, I've made you a leader, so uh, so don't spoil my name. Be a good leader. Uh, my uh, name is on at stake right now." No, Paul is saying, "You are an overseer, which the Holy Spirit." has made you to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What a powerful last few words to leaders. Listen, firstly, take heed of yourself. Look after your own self, your personal life, your spiritual life, your own life. Take heed, be in control of your own life. Then look after the sheep. You have to oversee the sheep, the church, Right and three, the, you have become leaders not by my appointing but by the appointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has appointed you, and then he goes on to say that you have to oversee the church which God has purchased by the shedding of His own blood. So it is not a man-made thing that we are doing here. The church that you are looking after was a, was established on the blood that was shed on the cross. So it's a heavy, high calling that you all have. And Paul is encouraging the church, the elders, He's saying, look after what has been handed to you. He doesn't say, go and enjoy yourself. The church is planted, let it grow on its own. No, look after, take heed. Take heed of what you're doing, why you're doing it. Take heed of how you will raise up the next leadership take heed of the church which is not because not because i came here and started the church in ephesus but that was purchased by his own blood the blood of jesus so think about the price that jesus paid and how much more you must look after this church right so we see that paul was really you know bringing the core of elders and leadership in these verses. Then later on, we see the role of the elder in the church. Uh, those three points, spiritual maturity, set a godly example of, a Christ, of the Christian life. Then you have spiritual ministry, labor in word and doctrine. That means what? Firstly, you act mature. Don't act foolish. Don't act silly. Set a godly example. People are watching over you. You're an elder of the church. Learn how to speak. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, learn to lead a quiet life. Right? So set a godly example. Let people see you and you know, uh, commend you for the way that you're living. Two, spiritual ministry, labor in the word and doctrine. That means spend time in the word. Spend time in, in, in the scriptures. Spend time in prayer and in ministry. Uh, spend time ministering to people. Labor. It's not going to be easy. It's a task that you have to do. Labor. 
Make sure that the doctrine that you're preaching is true, is right. Remember, because Paul has seen all kinds of doctrines coming in, all kinds of new ideologies. He's saying, stay true to the doctrine. It is your responsibility as a leader, as an elder, to make sure the doctrine is right. Thirdly, spiritual oversight, which means guard the sheep. I like that word guard. He's not saying control. It's not manipulate. He's saying guard them. When a wolf comes or a lion comes, you guard the sheep. You must be in a place of giving your life for the sheep. No one knew it better than David. David knew. Was David willing to give his life for the sheep? Definitely, yes. Why? Why would he go and fight a lion and a bear? As a young boy, if you've seen a lion and a bear, you'll, we will run away. But he fought it. He said, no, this is my sheep. If I have to die, I will die. But I'm not letting them take my sheep. This is mine. It's, it's, I have seen them. This, they belong to my house, and I'm not going to let them. I'm not going to get let any lion or wolf or any animal, bear, or anything come near my sheep. They are mine. And that's how God looks at it. And that's how we must look at our church, our congregation, our people. They are mine. So if I feel that there is a certain thing, you know, that I must guard parents against, I must do it. You know, one of the things I always tell parents in churches, especially with children, is spend time with your children. Right? Spend time with your children. And I tell them, don't spend too much time on TV and phone and all this digital media. Don't give them too much. Now, it may sound like I'm, contro uh, like I'm you know, controlling them, but I'm not. I tell them, see, I'm, it's, it's my duty to tell them. But it's their responsibility whether they want to or they don't want to. Right? So I don't control them. I don't say, take the phone and give it to me. I'll keep it for the whole week. No, it's theirs. It's their responsibility. But as a leader, as an elder, or uh, as a pastor of the church, what I do is I tell them, see, this can affect the child as the child grows. So what you can do is try and change things around. Try to do something else with your kid. Try to go out more often. There's some effort that you'll have to put in. Because what am I doing? I'm guarding them. I don't want to see them get into trouble. And you know, I don't want them to go through the challenges that many of them are already going through. So it's my responsibility. And that's what the uh, elders did. Spiritual maturity, spiritual ministry, spiritual oversight. Then we see the emergence of ministry teams in the local church. And I think we all know about this, right? Ministry teams, Paul, Barnabas, ministry team. Paul, Timothy, Timothy, Titus, Barnabas, John Mark, teams, ministry teams. We see the emergence of this. And of course, there were many, many, many uh, other people also who started ministry teams who went about preaching and ministering the gospel, right? So ministry teams. Uh, and something that we have in APC, we always, we, we want ministry teams, right? Whenever we go to missions, we have, we go as a team, right? So it's not like, you know, sometimes I go with two people, two, two of them come with me, or I join uh, another two of them. Just because, you know, a pastor is coming, that doesn't mean you know, I'm the leader of the team, no. We all three, if it's three people, we are a three, we, are, we three are a team. If, if, if the person tells me, uh, you know, can you go uh, set the chairs in the room? I'll do it. Why? Because we are a team. I can't tell him, hey, in the team, I'm the leader, I'm the pastor. No, you go do that. I'll go and preach. No, that's the thing with the team. We're all the same, right? In a team, when a, in a soccer team, you can have one person you know, if there's a World Cup tournament, the 12th man and 11th and the 12th man, I mean the substitutes, the entire World Cup they may, have, may not have played. But do they get a medal? They may feel, oh man, what is this? Not in one game I got. But they will get the medal. They'll get the prize money. They are part of the team. They've not even played. 
they've taken water and given that's it but they get the medal hey you're part of the world cup team why because they're part of the team so in ministry teams we see the emergence of ministry teams in the book of acts everyone were the same look at paul and timothy what a beautiful example paul and timothy paul whose level of maturity is so high he's saying timothy is my brother in christ he's my friend he's my son he never put him down he understood the value of teams luke you look at you know luke and later on paul joins with luke towards the end of his uh, aristarchus also is there so all these are ministry teams titus right uh, we see the emergence of that then after the local the new testament the early church matures comes the emergence of senior leaders and pastors right so timothy if you see uh, uh, the letter to timothy th paul refers to timothy as the pastor of the local church right meaning he is the overseer the pastor he was appointed to go and pastor the church in in ephesus timothy is given the leadership over the elders so remember this there were elders there were deacons already in the church timothy was chosen and timothy was over the elders remember paul writes to timothy and says don't let anyone look down upon you because of your age you are the leader you make the decisions you stand strong preach the word right stand in faith so he's he, we see the emergence of pastors happening there so the primary authority in a local church is the senior leader who is responsible both to feed and guide the local church the lord jesus will hold the senior leader responsible for all that happens in a local church now think of this you know if you want to plant a church and over time you become a leader and the church grows you have elders you have deacons or you have ministry teams associate pastors all of this it says here that god will hold you accountable for what is happening within the local church you are in you are you have to take responsibilities for things that worked things that didn't work so the task is high the position looks good but the responsibility is very high right so we will stop here we will continue next session uh, on this course from fivefold ministers and team ministry um, and then we'll keep going forward from there right so we'll take a break we'll come back and we'll get into our next course